audiobook narrator Mike Scott. When selecting your next audiobook, choose from some of the great titles narrated by audiobook narrator Mike Scott, like Bloody Autumn, the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1864. And if you're an author or publisher interested in having your written works produced as audiobooks, give Mike a shout at MikeScottVoice.com. Mike Scott, the voice of history. Well, we all went through that. So it was actually exciting when everything went to digital because my parents got two more channels. One of them is entirely black and white. Me TV. Oh, yeah. My dad watches that all the That's like like old, old shows, right? And the Rifleman and all that. Yeah, yeah. Some of them are in color. Oh, so yeah, there you go. I got you. I got you. Yeah. Like that. Baby, if you've ever wondered... Wondered whatever became of me. Shh. I'm living on the air in Cincinnati. Oh my. Cincinnati WKRP. Got kind of tired of packing it and unpacking. Slick it up and butt out. Up and bump up. Got it. This is my warm up. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It is another Ask a Guide. It's been such a long time. You guys get them on a regular schedule, but sometimes there's a good deal of time between our recording of these Ask a Guides. Isn't that right, Eric? Yeah, Matt, that's right. And so um, we uh, you, sometimes you get rusty. You get rusty and you forget how to do it. So yeah, a little bit here and there, you know, a little bit here and there. Let's do some housekeeping quick before we get to our guest and, uh, and stuff. Uh, uh, oh, oh, so so much exciting stuff has occurred. Number one, we've launched uh, the um, uh, reservation service with um, on our website for Indeed. guides. Indeed. So now as a listener, you can get, uh, you can hire a licensed guide right through our website. And, um, we had our first tour today actually from that. Yeah. The first one actually went out. And the person who, uh, did that tour also happens to be tonight's guest totally accidentally, right? We didn't plan it that way. It just worked out that way. The great Jesse Wheedleton is with us. Hello, Jesse. Hey. And how did it go? You tell me, uh, as a guide, was it easy for you to, uh, what did you have to do to meet your, your group there? How does it all work? We met at the West End Guide Station, and then we did a point-to-point tour through Perfect. the park, and we ended at the National Cemetery. And nobody got lost? No. Nobody got lost? Follow oh, the man. leader worked? They were from Minnesota. Minnesota. So now, did you hear the accent in my voice? Did I pick it up? I did. You us? picked it up. You picked it up. <laughs> that yeah. happens. It's a good thing you aren't Australian, because... Oh. Go home real you know, I'm so bad in Australian accents. I, if I were Australian, I'd probably have a bad one. Like I wouldn't be able to do it right. Um, so before you met them there at the West End Guide Station, how did you know you even had a tour? <laughs> oh, interesting. You should ask. I got several emails notifying me that my tour started at 2 p.m. today, and uh-huh. then I got a startling text at 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. asking me where I was. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> so the tours go; they really can go at any time. But Bob, you know, was the first one who gave us dates to Time book, too. and he likes nine and two, nine and two. Okay, so every day nine and two. That's fair. Bob got booked through uh, another entity and uh, and he said, I can't do Monday. And I said, OK. And I left the slots up there. I just took Bob off of them and I and I made it call to book. OK, so they had a call to book where we discovered something very important. It had my personal phone number <laughs> <laughs> because I was very confused as to how they were calling my phone because Whoops. we have it as a voicemail system. We got a Google voice number. So anyway, uh, call to book. Uh, so the, but the guy calls on Friday and, uh, and his name was oh, yeah. Tim. He's a very nice guy. He says, I want to do a tour. And I said, uh, is this with Getty's bike or addressing Gettysburg? And he says, addressing Gettysburg. And I'm just bewildered because I'm like, well, how'd you get my number? You know, I'm like, <laughs> and he says, well, it's the number that's on the website. So I was like, well, I got to go change that. Anyway, long story short. Cool. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Long story short, though, he, uh, uh, I called Jesse and Jesse 
was our savior. So even time. if it says call to book, some of us just have commitment issues in advance, but if we're free, we'll definitely do it the next day. That's true. Jesse, I've been after her. You're not alone. I've been after a few <laughs> of our guest guides uh, to give me some dates to try to sell them for. And, uh, oh yeah, I'm really interested in this. And they never give me the dates. <laughs> We but, don't have tour minimums this year. We might just go to Alaska. Uh, do you, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were like rolling in dough. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm I'll... not, but I could die, you know? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, well, well, if you didn't so. die last year, then you're probably going to make it through this year. Really? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, who knows? It's supposed to be I'm the best year ever. I'm not even half vaccinated yet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I am at the bottom of the list. <clears throat> nah, don't so, worry about it. You'll July. be fine. Anyway, so that that's one of the things that we have going now. It's uh, we've got a few reservations. Also, if you plan on coming to any of the get out of the car tours this year, all you got to do is go to uh, dressinggettysburg.com slash tours. Uh, get on the calendar. Find the date of the tour. It's marked as such. Just find the calendar. Yeah. Go to the month and you'll see it's the third Saturday of each month. It's marked as a get out of the car tour. Uh, all you need to do is register. They're free. But uh, we would just like to get an idea of who's coming or, or not even who, but how many people are coming. So we just want to get a head count um, for that. So that's uh, one thing you could do there. Anything else, Eric? Anything else? Oh, oh, oh I know. There is something else. Oh. The first lieutenants have made it on the scene. Um, many people have promoted themselves from second lieutenant to first lieutenant on uh, Patreon now. It's patreon.com slash address in Gettysburg. And those uh, first lieutenants, they get uh, everything that everybody below them has, but they also get video versions of the shows. Uh, In addition to that, we'll do live uh, streams uh, with them just to kind of uh, talk a bit and just, you know, see what's going on with our listeners and things and other things that we uh, will add as we go. Or maybe we'll create a captain level. We're not sure. We're going to see. There's a couple of things. But first, we got to get this computer ironed out. Yeah. Because we've had some issues with this computer. It's all like brand new components. But for some reason, it's just with the video editing, it is being fussy. And and, and it crashed today. And uh, it crashed. Just yeah, yeah. No, there was a driver issue, oh, and it was yeah, just yeah, you know, oi, vey, schmear. So I, what? I, it's Yiddish, or it's it's a very <laughs> poor it? version of Yiddish. Yes. So anyway, that's uh, that's Carry what we on. have there. Carry so on. today we are talking about the monumentation era. By the way, before you forget, don't forget follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Make sure you have your notifications turned on. Also, if you use the Apple Podcast app, please leave a five star review. Reviews, liking, sharing, uh, and subscribing are the best ways to help us grow uh, our audience and to keep informed as to what's going on in our wonderful world. Okay, now we're on to monumentation, the monumentation era. Jesse, my God, we put out the call to our wonderful patrons at Patreon com slash address in Gettysburg and they flooded the inbox with questions for you about the monumentation era who knew it was so interesting to people I didn't know that I knew oh you knew that's well but I didn't so Jess give us a little bit of a background on the monumentation era when was it what was it all about go ahead uh, give you know fill us in on all these things here before we get to the questions uh, well, that's a lot of, I already have a bunch of questions, you know, Matt, uh-huh. but, um, uh, the monumentation era basically starts, I mean, there's a lot of firsts that you could pinpoint. The first monument right. is the cornerstone for the soldiers national cemetery in 1865, but, um, the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association was established in April of 1864. And that is something we're going to talk about in a couple of these questions because that's really significant <laughs> that people that live here before the war is over realize that something so significant had happened here. They don't know how the war is going to turn out at this right. point. Um, but That's a they, good point. They don't even know if their side has won yet. But um, Keep going. What starts that is the National Cemetery. So the the first thing is dealing with the dead that have been buried on the field but can't stay there. And initially it's the Union dead that are moved, and they've got to buy land for that. But it's land on Cemetery Hill that's key to the action. Mm. So that sort of gets the wheels turning, and we'll get into the details, I think, 
later. Sure, sure. Uh, I'm sure it'll all come up. With purchasing the land that the soldiers fought for beginning at that time. So it starts. So in other words, what you're saying is soon. it's uh, purchasing the land for the cemetery itself, but also the land that was fought over, which is also the so same really thing. But are you talking about thought- East Cemetery Hill or are you just talking about what is now the National Cemetery? First, what is now the National Cemetery. Okay. So that is the land that the first land that is purchased because of the battle. And Got it. then it expands outside of that, but that really gets the ball rolling. So the seed is planted that it's not enough to mark the gravestones of the people that died. Yeah. We should mark and start to establish a park <clears throat> on that on the field. Okay. And then it's still well <laughs> It's, it's ended in the National Park property, but it's still possible to place monuments about Gettysburg anywhere you can figure it out. Get permission to do it. So I don't know what year the Drummer Boy monument went in across from Mr. G's, the Unity Park. That was a Boy Scout Eagle Scout project. Yeah. 2016. That Gary Castile sculpted. Oh, yeah. yeah it was, was 2016 they dedicated So it. that's the most recent and then the Culp's Hill one that he did by the Abolition Brewing Company, that was also recent. So if you can find a place to yes. to establish a mining, but also a way to pay for the maintenance of it, you can do something. Right, right. Okay. So, you know, for example, people think that, you know, in order, there are interpretive plaques going up by the Confederate monuments that there needs to be more on the field dealing with what um, the black community went through during the battle, that maybe that might be something that is added to either something close to the park. Well, there is um, Lincoln Cemetery. And there's some markers across the street from that on Long Yeah, Lane. so there are painted murals there. Yeah. Um, I, a lot of tourists don't go that way, so they probably don't see it. But there, there is n- not a lot, but there's some stuff um, that you could see. Uh, you could see like the grave of, of uh, is it, do you say Basil or Basil or Basil I Biggs? Avoid pronouncing. You pro- <laughs> Mr. Biggs. We sure. call him. Uh, his grave is there. There's there's a few other prominent uh, African Americans who are in Lincoln Cemetery. The problem is you can't get into I, the I cemetery. I would say Basil, but yeah, I say Basil, Basil. I also say Gettysburg, and well, people say Gettysburg. Yeah, Gettysburg is wrong. I'm just over it. <laughs> All right. So so uh, you said the first uh, monument was what the cornerstone uh, for the uh, Soldiers National Cemetery, or for the for the what what, what the hell was it? The Soldiers National Monument. monument. In the cemetery, or what is now the cemetery. Um, What was the first memorial to a regiment or something put up on the field or monument to a regiment? See, it's, it's, uh, well, there's the Minnesota urn. Uh Uh-huh. See this? I didn't go back. Well, that's okay. That was the, what what I was looking for. That's the answer I was looking for. that's what I said today. I was just like, oh man, I forget the year. Of the urn. I think it's 1864. Oh, 67. Okay. Don't worry, Fred Hawthorne isn't listening to this. (laughs) I think that's six, 67 because the cornerstone goes in in 66. Okay. Yeah. It's and those two numbers that get swapped. So 67 yeah. and 76 get swapped in my brain. So if you say it's 67, mm-hmm. I think New, it's Numeric it. dyslexia. Yeah. Well, I have like, a, to me, all of the numbers have like a color associated with them. Yeah, I do that too. And I kind of memorize the color combination when I memorize. Interesting. Numbers. So it kind of messes me up. So, yeah, like Custer died in 18 such green. such a great job for that. You know. <laughs> okay, go. What? Continue. What? <laughs> Continue with your story. So the first monument. So the urn goes above the graves of the Minnesota dead buried in the National Cemetery. But it's in the cemetery. So if you think, you know, of the battlefield. But well, the do you first think National Park, battlefield. Cemetery, where the cemetery is, was also battlefield. Right. Oh, it's so confusing. But then in 1879, the second Massachusetts monument is really the first regimental position. But before that, people were marking places where they lost people. So that's that's kind of the first concern of the veterans coming back. They remember where Reynolds was killed, hmm. where Colonel Vincent and, you know, O'Rourke and those events that were traumatic and the people that they lost are the first. That's why they look like little headstones because they're just individual tributes to, to these people. Yeah. 
Uh, was it, was Massachusetts it, gets that Massachusetts kind of starts a lot of things <laughs> because like the Revolutionary War. Uh, sure, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and the segregation of the states in the National Cemetery. Um, but once the second Massachusetts Monument goes in, then that's the subject of these veterans reunions. So it's well, we're going to place our. So it, that's now. over by Spangler Spring. Yep, Second Mass. Okay, so that was one of the first ones on the battlefield. The the first regimental, regimental yep. monument. Because the urn the is first, a memorial, the right? The first monument on the battlefield is the monument to Strong Vincent's wounding. That's like that tall headstone. Yes. But it, that's not the oldest monument, <laughs> even though it was the first because the original one got knocked down by a tree or something. So. Oh, okay. So, so that's not the original. If you're looking for the oldest one, it's another marker in the wheat field. It's a whole. The, the, the oldest what in the wheat field? What's what Monuments. We, okay. Which one is that? Um, one, it's a guy in the 27th Connecticut, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh right well, along the wheat field road. Uh, yeah. Well, we saw it on uh, one of the tours. But that one's not in its original spot because. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so they're moved when they get money for it. It's, it's complicated. Everything's yeah. complicated and there's pretty much always an Was it a colonel? For, Was it a colonel? Uh, Maybe. Le- no. L- L- Maybe not. I think it was a lieutenant. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Veronica, Google that, please. So there's a, there's... We, we field road uh, marker. Uh, you see what, see, what, see what you find. Okay, go ahead. All right. I bet uh, lieutenant uh-huh. colonel. We don't know. 20, oh, well, 27th, 27th Connecticut. Connecticut, but we don't know anything beyond that. Okay. <clears throat> Go ahead, Jess. You're going to edit all this out right now. No, no, no. I this know is, you're not. This is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not I'm, what we do here. I'm we don't pe- edit. I'm at peace with this. Yes. This is very real. It's just my audio file <laughs> being immortalized. <laughs> when, you're, when you're old and you die and the community looks back in the Adams County Historical Society archives and they find this, they'll say, oh, listen to how young she sounds. Mm -hmm. And then everybody will be happy. All right, so anyway, so while she's looking that up, uh, the strong, so you're not counting the strong Vincent, you know, the carving in the rock where strong Vincent supposedly fell. You're talking about no. the, uh, the, the thingamabob down. The, but what constitutes the, like, a monument. So, thing. so right. the fifth New Hampshire can move a boulder from the battlefield and put it in a spot and that's a monument, but the boulders there and you carve the monument. It, you carve it. Is that a monument? Yeah. Okay. Here. So 27th uh, Connecticut, there are two monuments to the 27th Connecticut. The main monument is near Henry Ayers Merwin. Avenue. Merwin. Yes. Colonel, Mer- Lieutenant Jedediah Colonel Chapman. There you so go. He before he, he says it so I can salvage my Good job. Now I'm just going to edit that out. <laughs> I'm going to edit all this out and just make it look like it came out of my mouth. I don't know. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Merwin. That's it. And Captain Jed Chapman fell. And uh, so those markers there, yeah, and then the advanced position of the regiment. Okay, so you got it. They've actually mapped my voice, and this is a deep fake of <laughs> what I said. Or you not know. That's all right. We all make mistakes. So go ahead, Jesse. You are continuing the story of the monumentation era. So let's get us into the uh, 1870s. Is there a lot going on in the 70s now? Uh, 73 would be the 10 year anniversary. Did they, did they care at that point or were they too busy building their lives? Uh, Most of it is building to a climax around the 25th anniversary as far as regimental monumentation. Okay. Goes. And then, um, and then what happens after that is the war department takes over several civil war battlefields and they want to instruct the military. So they have Chickamauga and Chattanooga, Antietam, Shiloh, Vicksburg, and Gettysburg. Mm-hmm. And they are, that's kind of the first time they've got to convince the Union veterans to allow them to mark Confederate positions because they want to basically map out the field like a chessboard and have both sides represented and study the battle. I, I meant to ask you this before, so I hate to rewind to the 1860s, but uh, Batchelder, doesn't he go around with a lot of the veterans and mark different things with stakes in the ground and, and all that stuff? So a lot of the, what, early monuments might be on the spot that he actually staked out or? Well, and if they're on a, a 
a different one. It's just because through his research, it's been adjusted. So he's, uh-huh. he was the source that the GBMA is, he's the chief historian, the okay. first chief historian of the park. Okay. Because, Got I mean, there's a long story there. <laughs> as far as how Batchelder comes into the story, he was looking to do a painting. He does the painting, but in the research for the troop positions in the painting, he ends up talking to so many people that he's the expert. Right. And he's talking to Confederate wounded that are in the hospitals. He's talking to Union and Confederate because the best, the best fact that you could have is the most opposite perspectives coming together. Yeah, sure. And so it's and it's hard for people to remember what happened to them. So <sighs> if, with a monumentation, it's a monument. It's set in stone, but it's really not. It's just a uh-huh. combination of memories to the best of their ability after going through right physical trauma. Cuz I always wondered, you know, cuz Gettysburg was they, they've been through other battles besides Gettysburg. And they're all traumatic and it's hard to remember. And they fight on all sorts of people's farms. So I talk about this stuff on every tour and um, I feel like I'm repeating the tour. I just gave Tim and now he's going to listen to your podcast and hear it all over again. (laughs) But, (laughs) but I talk about this on every tour because I think it's what speaks to people the most, just putting themselves in somebody's shoes that has been through this experience. And now they've got to remember what happened and to the, to the, inch on the on the field when it's just one battle in a score of uh, scores a score of scores, scores. Yes. yeah you uh sure. you're not thinking as you're going through it um i've got to remember all these details because someone's going to ask me one day like you're just like but get then, me out of this but then we get lucky because at gettysburg the the boulders are so unique yeah (laughs) you know yeah so you know they'd remember huge everybody remembers devil's den if the last time they came here was when they were six years old yeah it might be the only thing you remember and if that's the only thing protecting you from gunfire (laughs) you might remember the specific hole underneath the rock you know or or something like that sure the stone walls that divide the properties the boulders on the field are going to help people feel their way back to what happened Okay, so continuing on then with the story of monumentation. You do know we have 50 questions to answer. Like, I know, but but you want to give, okay. I'm, just, I'm just trying to get you to give the background here. And it's 49. We took one out. Oh, okay. So go ahead. But, yeah, so it started before the war was over and is still going on. Okay, <laughs> so. are still at the top of the headlines so that you're right uh, well yeah we're still talking about that so okay so the let me let me uh, try to help you through with what i'm trying to get you to do here um the monumentation era is from when do we say it starts 1860s is the earliest stuff and then it goes all the way through the whens through 2016 well that's but not I the mean, monumentation the, era yeah, okay well, i'm talking when the veterans are doing it you know okay. what we think of as the monumentation era is what when? You just just say it. Uh, no, I'm I'm <laughs> asking you. I'm not the expert. <laughs> it's it's the what well, the, it's the, while they're alive still, right? But but the bulk of them are what 1880s and 1890s when they're going up. Eric, uh, I'm not going to pick a year. Maybe someone has a year out there, yeah, but it, if there's you know, all right, we're going to say 1880s and 1890s. Yeah, when you, when you look at like all of the <laughs> you know Michigan Day, New York Day. Uh, Pennsylvania Day, they're all in the 1880s. It's like 1885 to 1889. Like the, the got, monument on Little Round Top goes up in 1890, the 44th and 12th New York. And that's one of the last. But then, you know, you have the larger state memorials going up. The 50th, the 50th anniversary. Yeah, right. So we're going like uh, late, late 1800s, early 1900s is when the bulk of the monuments that we see here today are going up, right? There's been some over the years, uh, the uh, 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 centennial, uh, you have some monuments going up to, to the uh, southern states, right? Or put up by the southern states. Mm-hmm. But we're not getting into that today. We're just talking about, <laughs> that's a whole other show. That's Can like worms. its own show, yeah. But we're just talking about the... Um, uh, the one that the veterans had something to do with. Okay, so what we're going to do then is there's nothing more you want to add to that. No. Okay, so we're going to take a break. We're going <laughs> to take a break because, like Jesse said, we have. 
<laughs> we have 50 questions and we've got to get to them. So we're going to uh, take our quick little commercial break and then we'll come back and we will do just that. Answer those questions. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Addressing Gettysburg is proud to announce that hiring one of the guides you hear on our show is now as easy as pie. By coming on our show, the licensed battlefield guides do all of us a great service, and we want to give back to them while making your access to them effortless. So when you're booking your hotel for your next trip to Gettysburg, make sure you go to addressinggettysburg.com slash tours and book a guide, too. Just go to addressinggettysburg.com slash tours, choose the date you'll be here and book. Due to COVID protocols, you and the others on the tour will follow the guide who will be in his or her own car. For your safety and ease of travel, every tour is limited to four vehicles. And if you have a large group, a custom tour request, or you want to request a particular guide, we've got you covered there as well. So hurry, spring and summer are just around the corner. Plan your trip to Gettysburg today and book a guide at addressinggettysburg.com slash tours. That's addressinggettysburg.com slash tours. Tell you what, this might come in handy if the lockdowns continue throughout the winter. Plowman Cider is a proud sponsor of Addressing Gettysburg and wants to offer our listeners the chance to bring Adams County's delicious agricultural countryside to the comfort of your own home this winter. Grown and fermented on Plowman's seventh generation family farm, their heirloom and bittersweet apple varieties will soothe you right down to the ground. You can get Plowman Cider on Gettysburg's historic Lincoln Square at their tap room or have it shipped to your home by visiting plowmancider.com. Addressing Gettysburg listeners can use the coupon code CIDERPOD at checkout to enjoy 15% off your order. So put a taste of Adams County in your glass this winter with Plowman Cider. Go to plowmancider.com and use promo code CIDERPOD for 15% off. That's P-L-O-U-G-H-M-A-N-C-I-D-E-R.com. You must be 21 years of age and shipping is subject to your state's regulations. Regulations. Getty's Bike Tours has something uh, special for you. It's a special offer that they've got uh, going on. If you call 717-752-7752 and you make a reservation by April 20th of 2021, you're going to get 15% off the tour reservation. Now, this is for tours only, not for rentals. So you got to make sure that you call 717-752-7752 before or by April 20th to receive that 15% off of your tour. Your tour can be any time in the 2021 season. But you gotta make the reservation by April 20th. 15% off, you gotta call 717 752 7752. Someone will get back to you if they don't pick up, and you will let them know that you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg, and they'll give you 15% off. You know how I know this? Because it was my idea. Think outside the bus. 717 752 7752. That's 717 752 7752. For those of you who prefer it that way, 717 752 7752. A nation divided. The battle that changed America. Avatars. Generals. Artifacts. Games. 360 degree views. An immersive battlefield experience. A new way to discover history. Gettysburg. A nation divided. An augmented reality. Narrated by Scott Eastwood. Download it from your phone's app store today and support Addressing Gettysburg by entering GBerg1863 in the referral code prompt after downloading. Do you have a local business in Gettysburg? Do you want to reach people who are itching to visit us, but don't know exactly where to stay, where to eat, or what to do while they're here? Well, then you should consider advertising on Addressing Gettysburg. You can reach thousands of Gettysburg enthusiasts per month who are within a four to eight hour drive of us, as well as all over the world. Reach them where they are before they're already in town. This is the more affordable and more 21st century way to advertise. So contact us at advertise at addressinggettysburg.com for more information. That's advertise at addressinggettysburg.com. Oh, our favorite place to get books and spend way too much money. Not because they're expensive, but because we buy too many books. What is the name of that place, Eric? 
It's for the historian, Matt. <laughs> That's right. That's right. They've got a wide variety of titles, new and used, uh, military books from publishers like Osprey, Casemate, Gettysburg Publishing, Stackpole, Savas Beatty, McFarlane, UNC Press, and more. Uh, I... I uh, I haven't been there in two weeks, and it's and it is nothing against them. It's because I have no more room to put books. I have I have to get more. I have to make more room in my house, and uh, then put a bookshelf there. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. Like I've been out of bookshelf space for quite some time, and now I've filled up all the other available space around my bookshelves with stacks of books. Yeah. <laughs> so- Yes. So I have to lay off for a while. Yeah, and maybe go on top of my bookshelves, like start stacking them there, maybe get some bookends or something. Yeah, that could work. I've, I've got like helmets and hats and stuff up there on mine. But. Yeah, so do I. And but like pictures of my niece and nephew, but they may have to come down because they don't come and visit their favorite uncle anymore. <laughs> and uh, they have toy soldiers at For the Historian, which I will not be getting for my niece and nephew since they don't come and visit, and model kits, which I also won't be. Games, children's books, all this stuff I'm, I'm not getting for them because they won't come and visit me. Uh, of course, it's not all their fault. It's really their mom and dad's fault because, you know, they don't there drive down. They, they say they're coming in May. But that remains to be seen. I'll believe that when I see that. Blame your uh, siblings. Yeah. So anyway, stop by and check them out on your next visit to Gettysburg. Or even better, you can order online. You don't need to wait until you get here. You can order online at ForTheHistorian.com. And whether it's online or in person, just mention that you heard about them on Address in Gettysburg in the uh, note to seller box online or to their face when you go into the store. And they will either refund your shipping costs if it's an online sale or you'll get 24, 20% off the retail price when you go into the store. That's ForTheHistorian.com or 717-685-5207. That's ForTheHistorian.com, 717-685-5207. You're listening to the Addressing Gettysburg Podcast with Matt Kelly. All right, we're back now with our questions from our patrons over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. You want to ask some questions to our guides? Then you got to become a patron over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. Okay, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. JP Horsemanship, the horsiest man around, starts off by cutting to the quick. How controversial, Jesse, were, con- uh, <laughs> were controversial monuments. How controversial were Confederate monuments when they were erected, and how did the local community react versus how the Union veterans reacted? First, how controversial were they? Were they controversial back then? Uh, yes, they've always <gasps> been controversial. What? Because we're trying to deal with <laughs> sewing our country back together mm-hmm. after its inhabitants fought and killed each other for years. So right. it's something we're still working on, but <laughs> and that we've always been working on. And it's where you're going to have sort of a division between the the veterans, the Union veterans who view the Confederate monuments, Confederate battle flag, and anything like that as a representation of treason. Uh, what do you call the flag, Eric? The treason rag. The treason rag. See? <laughs> um and nervous laughter. It's not <laughs> <laughs> but, uh. and then you have the people that are looking at the big picture, looking at how, how do we tell the story of this battle? How do we make sure that this story endures in, in history? The people are still studying this. How do we include everyone <laughs> but make it about education? Um but also move toward reconciliation, bringing the veterans back together themselves uh, eventually on the battlefield. So there are there are first some um, argue, little arguments back and forth when they're just when the War Department takes over again. Their aim is to equally mark the battlefield, mm-hmm. and they want to do this in a way that doesn't involve too much emotion as best as they as they can do it so they're not going to make the union army look like the victor over you know they're trying to trying to remain impartial when they're coming up with all of the 
the wording for the tablets, the placement of the you know, the cannons that's happening at that time. This is in, the War the Department, 18, you're saying? Yes. Okay. In 1895, the gotcha. War Department takes over. And this is one of their first things. But John Batchelder is still involved. And he, if you look through the Batchelder papers at this time, he's writing back and forth to Union veterans, including generals and different officers, and asking them what they think about it. And when we're just talking about these these impartial markers, um, people like Dan Sickles are writing back saying that they support them, that anything that you'd add to it would create more interest. So they're looking at visitation on the battlefield as well. But in the eyes of Union veterans that support Confederate markers, it's because you can't change the outcome of the story. <laughs> And the more you show how much there was against them, mm. the more powerful their victory becomes. Right. What good is Batman without the Joker is what I always say. And you'll also find out over time, not just... Nothing with, on that one? Nothing you didn't, you didn't like that? If it's a movie reference, I just talk right over it. Yeah. Well, it's not. It's. <laughs> I think anybody what? can get this. It's what good is Batman without the Joker? All right. Other right. people like it. Ted yes. Savas liked I get it. You. Okay. I got you. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I got thoughts in my brain. I know, I know, I know. You're and you. I can't knock you off course because then you <laughs> you uh, you get all flustered. Don't don't worry. Just just keep and going. And then I start swallowing, <laughs> <laughs> swallowing Nobody and nervous laughter. And yeah, it's okay. Okay, let's just let's give Jesse her quiet. I want to ask you a bunch of questions. Okay, and I want to have them answered immediately. Now go. Just a moment of silence for the <laughs> joke landing. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, all right. But it, it's it's not just the monuments; it's also uh, like the cyclorama painting. And there's the more and just the the how close it was in the battle. The, all these things are exaggerated by Union veterans because it makes it seem more powerful when they overcome this. You know that the oh. Confederates came minutes. You know between does it, you know disaster for the Union Army, but they charged at the last second, you know, and, and that saved the day. So no, but it's not going to be a good story if the Confederacy never had a chance. Again, right. Me. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. Um, so the, so, the, uh, the Union veterans though, they're feeling that to put up anything more than these war department markers would be too much, or are they even against those? I don't, I really haven't done the the uh, original source research on the people, what they, it, it does seem like Batchelder's trying to get support. Like he's, you know, trying to get evidence to fight back as he wants to place Southern markers on the field. Right. But I don't know, you know, what was brought up first in that instance. I know uh, what Eric found an article from the second Maryland. Oh monument. yeah. You know, so the different newspapers start talking about that one. Do you just want to do that one now? So or? that one that I sent you is actually, uh, that comes from you, the second Maryland Monument, right? Uh, that is out of the National Tribune, which was the newspaper of the GAR. Uh, but it, it comes a month after Pennsylvania Day in 1889. So in October of 89, this article comes out, and it's actually a resolution from the Abe Patterson Post uh, 88 in Allegheny City. And what's happened is these guys came to Gettysburg to dedicate the monuments for most of the Pennsylvania regiments that were here. And they, they realized that there is a monument to a Confederate regiment on Culp's Hill. And they are that had been there since upset. 1886, but yeah. nobody really noticed it until all. <laughs> yeah, of the, it, it was like uh, nobody realized it was there, and then the Pennsylvanians show up, and they're very bitter about this. Uh, and uh, it, if you read, if you read like the monument dedication speeches for the Pennsylvania regiments, they a, a number of them talk about this being an issue. Uh, I think it's J.C. Truesdale, by the 105th PA, talks about it. He's a chaplain, and, and his and Thomas Merchant of the 84th Pennsylvania, they've got two of the more vitriolic ones 
uh, out of Pennsylvania. Merchant actually says that all of the uh, United Confederate Veterans posts should have been squashed as soon as they came into being. Like, they have absolutely no reason to be around. And, and the government is not – no government on earth is strong enough to – to uh, maintain glorification of treason against itself. Mm. They're, they're very vitriolic speeches, some mm. of them. Um, but anyways, <clears throat> so you kind of have to understand, uh, you got to like you understand that side of it though. Sure. Absolutely. But then you also kind of understand the other side of it. Like, you know, we went through this together and you want to have some kind of fraternal order afterwards, but, yeah, it's just, it's such a complicated thing, and I think that's why it's still unresolved. Well, and when the veterans were alive, what is bringing the white Union and Confederate veterans together is their similar experience throughout the war. Yeah. You know, that they charged across fields just like Pickett's charge in the Union side at other battles. Mm -hmm. They went through the same awful experience. They were drafted. You know, mm. <laughs> there's so many similar experiences that they had. And, you know, some of them joined their local militia unit, not thinking the war would last more than a couple months. And here they are at the bloodiest battle <laughs> in the Civil War. Well, it, did you uh, did you have something to finish with that? Were you done with that? Oh, or? I mean, there's there's all kinds of stuff I can throw in there, but it, we'd be here but, all night. Okay. Well, and, and as far as the community's reaction in Gettysburg versus the Union veterans is what he's asking. Yeah, that was the next. The, the community of Gettysburg is is. I would say pro union. <laughs> they 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 don't want Confederate veterans buried in the national cemetery or the local cemetery. Um, so they always they've fought back in the past against against that. But union veterans, the government. When we talk about the government in the War Department years, the government is veterans, and the government the co government commissioners are union and Confederate veterans, and most of which fought at the battle. Um, so those are the people writing these impartial tablets. They're people that are, they have, I think, three union and one Confederate coming up with all of this. So, uh, contributing to the to what's on the tablets, you mean? To, this, to the tablets. And right. then when the Southern State Monuments going are start going on the field, the one that really has the most, the most of the letters back and forth, pro and 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 con is virginia's because people are still alive on both sides that have feelings about it um the other thing he asks and this this is uh my favorite question i think of the night um he says also do other countries have monuments to both the winner and the loser of their war or is that just something that we do and you found an interesting answer to this question. <laughs> so, I I am not an expert. In not an expert, but you other. found an answer that might might lead y'all to think that maybe it's not as cut and dry as because we think I it is today. Because I was just like, huh, I don't know. And so, because we just, hear this argument now, everybody yeah. says, "Well, why do you want monuments to the losers anyway?" And it's not exactly it's about that the easy. Str the struggle of any country to heal itself after something like that happens and the people that lost don't leave. They're a part. And right. They're a part it was of the country. Lincoln's, <laughs> it was Lincoln's, you know, desire. plan and right desire plan. to fight the war until the southern states were reincorporated. You know, the let them up easy quote. So which <laughs> um, Andrew Johnson took a little too far after but. Uh, Lincoln was assassinated, but, but so if you, to save us some time, just go to, <laughs> well, give us I a do? little, give us a little bit of what you got there. Cause you can't just don't tell them just where to go. You, you were saying that it, what was it in China and I was half eating my pizza and half listening and half vaccinated at the same time. So <laughs> forgive me. But, uh, in China there was, uh, there are monuments to losers in China. And I can't remember which conflict it was, but you, you found an interesting thing there. And I'm stalling for you. It was like yes. the Chinese Civil War and the Sino-Japanese War. Yes. Sino-Japanese. We helped you pronounce so they, some words. They in Szechuan. 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 Like the sauce. <laughs> See, this is why I'm not reading. The through. buffalo of China. We've already been through this. So people chime in uh, on this on Quora.com. Someone asked the same exact question. And okay. people chime in from all different countries. All over from, the world. From Brazil, from China, from Canada. So this is a from Brazilian from China Europe, saying what about from China? From Australia. 
And they're saying in, in this square in Sichuan, they have Sichuan. <laughs> I, don't know, I can't say this word. The square, square is Sichuan. The square has statues of both nationalists who lost the Civil War and the communist general who fought in it all next to each other. And it's probably the only place in the world where you'll find a statue of Chiang Kai-shek. Yeah. <laughs> And a statue of Mao Zedong at the same location. So, so that's interesting sim- that if the, the communist Chinese can l- have some kind of statue to their vanquished foe, it, it, it is kind of that kind of puts because so, I did think that we were the only country that had statues to the losers. Until well, you my, read that. my position on Confederate monuments is <laughs> that there's something to learn from all of it. And if you take the thing that starts the conversation away, you, you you lose the opportunity to talk about it in the same way with the same emotion. There's no time. <laughs> oh, you're pissing off Robert E. Lee, but go ahead, continue. I, I mean, that's basically... No, I agree with you. I agree. They, the they story, have to be used there's, there's so much for education. Here, you know, and there's no easy answer to any of this. <laughs> There's no easy answer to why was the Civil War fought in the first place. You know, right. that takes another two hours. Yeah. <laughs> it's not something you can put a blanket statement on in really any aspect of the controversy. I always thought that, uh, you know, uh, simple answers show simple minds. Someone says the Civil War is about one thing and one thing only, whatever that is. They've got a simple mind. And uh, they're giving a simple answer because it's nothing. It, you look at anything today. Ask anybody today what a certain issue is about. And you're not going to get a simple answer. And if you do, that person has a simple mind. But for the most part, if the person is has half a clue as to what's going on, it's going to be a complex answer because whatever it is, is a complex situation. The Civil War was a complex situa- situation. Anything that makes a country kill itself... <laughs> Is a complex situation. And to me, the thing that means the most in that situation is just studying individually what caused these people who might have acted differently under different circumstances to do what they did. Yeah. Like people that grew up in Gettysburg who moved to uh, West Virginia, then Virginia, and end up fighting in Lee's army on the farms of their families. Yeah. (laughs) You know. It's weird. It's right. But they when they moved there, there was no war. They were moving there for work. It was a job, you know, and then things change and you're kind of stuck and you have friends. Maybe you got a gal and you're part of the local drinking militia. And what are you going to do? You're going to go with your buddies. You're going to go fight this, you know, three week war or whatever. And they're, you know, they're kids. <laughs> That's a huge factor that I don't think I'm a lot so of people. Old and wise. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I was talking to somebody the other day about this, and and uh, we were we were talking about uh, the book An Environmental History of the Civil War. Have you read it? No. You got to read it. It's great. I'll let you borrow it. Um, and and they talk about you know just very basic things, fundamental things like diarrhea and diet, and why if you're starving you don't want to have a lot of. Uh, 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 like uh, fruits and vegetables if you're starving because it's just gonna, you're just going to have diarrhea. So anyway, uh, talking about all that stuff and people and whoever I was talking to was like, how do they do that? Like, you know, what? And they were able to, how are they able to do that? Blah, blah, blah. Keep on going and all that. And I'm like, they're 20 years old. There was a lot of things that I could do at 20 <laughs> years old that I can't do now. And they were miserable, but I was able to like grin and bear it. But I can't do that now. And that's the thing is like, we're not thinking like 20 year olds anymore because we're not. I'm 42. You're almost 50. So, I mean, you know, we have, <laughs> we have a long yeah, way. I'm, I'm older than strong Vincent. Yes. Think about that. Think about that. Yep. So do you want to move on to the next question now? Sure. Okay. Chaplain Cox ask, what ro- asks, what role did the town play in the monumentation of the battle? Did they like the idea of veterans coming to town and putting up monuments in their backyards? I mean, there's got to be somebody, you know, waving their cane at the... <laughs> you, know, you know there was. Uh, but, I mean, the town is the reason for the the battlefield well and the development in the extent i that happened i think for what we talked about earlier but um 
specifically, Gettysburg is on the map because it's the county seat of Adams County. The courthouse is here, so lawyers live close by. You mm. have, long story short, there are people with money in Gettysburg. <laughs> there are people yeah. running um, the industry in Gettysburg, and the two lawyers <laughs> that don't like each other <laughs> really get everything started. So you have David Wills, who has connections, and he's uh, going to be able to get the support of Governor Curtin and take over the cemetery project, right. which is something that his rival, David McConaughey, wanted to do because McConaughey was president of Evergreen Cemetery. Mm. So like, this is what I do. Don't and, make sense. You know, <laughs> that, yeah. I want It's my this. bag, baby. But he, he didn't have... He didn't have the right connections in that case, but McConaughey's the one that's like, well, if you've got that, then I'm going to start buying the rest of Cemetery Hill, and I'm going to buy Little Round Top and Culp's Hill, and so the David McConaughey gets the ball rolling, and really is the reason for the Gettysburg Memorial Association or GBMA. Uh, and so, yes, the townspeople have a great. <laughs> A great deal of influence, but and also they're they're very quickly making a buck off of tourists. After well, the battle, and they're right? able to offer fair prices. I mean, I don't know what those prices were, but people accepted it. You know, they had the choice to sell their sure. property. They didn't have to do that. Yeah, um, and like the st- you know the story of the Leicester House. Uh, well, has she moved it? Right. Or, yeah. So, so Lydia Leister does well. She, I mean, I've heard. Oh yeah. Several stories that she, uh, all the dead horses are all over her property. So she sells the bones. She mm-hmm. makes. I've heard that she made black paint after the bones were burned or the carcasses were burned of all the horse piles that are everywhere. And she builds an addition onto her home, but when the Memorial Association wanted to wanted to acquire that property. Of course, they didn't want the extra part, so she just sold her farm and moved the rest downtown, which is now a bed and breakfast attached to the Dobbin to House, the Dobbin house which yeah. they call the Leicester yeah, House, right? I believe they do the Lydia Leicester House. Yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting thing that the for a while that was a two story little farmhouse there, the Leicester House after the battle. And then she she took. See now, I heard ba- the story uh, Basil that Biggs that's cutting down the trees at the cops of trees. Yeah. And they're until, like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> until uh, Batchelder convinces him that he'd make more money selling it to the park. Yeah. But then there's also Joseph Scherfe, so who apparently loved tourists <laughs> and saved all the bullet holes in his house, and yes, you could still see them. Peaches when they'd walk through the orchard. Yeah. And, and really welcome the tourism. The, the park it's, has... It's an opportunity. Gettysburg's on the map now. You know, you get on board or get out of here and it's kind of the yeah, same feeling yeah. I have today. Yeah, it's the same thing. <laughs> your ladies' the, tourists just drive through town and can't go through the circle. Well, <laughs> they're running your... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Your business is alive because you're, of you're, it. You're, you have a roof over your head because of them. Right. Uh, the, the park service has uh, a peach in a jar. Yes. That's supposedly from the battle... I talk about this on, like, on, all, <laughs> on a lot of my tours. Um, what about it? But you can look it up on their Wait, wait, wait. wait. What do you talk about on the tours? Regarding the peach? The moldy peaches? Yeah. yeah. I talk about this. <laughs> what do you say? Well, just that, you know, there's a whole basement to the visitor center. <laughs> Like, and the, one of the coolest like the thing down the there is a black blob in the bottom of a jar, <laughs> but it's a, a yeah. can of peaches from. No, it's one peach. It's one peach, isn't it? I thought it was one peach or is it a I whole don't know jar what of it peaches? Is. It's, it's black. <laughs> it is black. <laughs> they just describe it as like a black. <laughs> it's disgusting. It's unrecognizable mold. organic yeah. material. But they, have, yes. they have pictures of most of the cool things in their collection. So even though it's hard to get down there, you have to like yeah. organize it. You can you can search it on their on the Park Service website and see pictures of. It is pretty neat though to uh, to see. But I the Leicester House though, I heard that uh uh, she th- that it wasn't that the park service wasn't interested in or the war department whoever it was wasn't interested in the second story it's just that she had it had you know it, it, she'd built it over time or whatever but she built it herself and so she was like well I built this and I'm taking it with me like it was more of a 
you know, that Pennsylvania Dutch way people are, you know, where it just doesn't make sense. Very like selfish and like, yeah, that type of a thing. So, but whatever, there's a million stories to all the different stories, a million versions. I mean, so go ahead. Uh, we'll move on to the next one. Ready? Yes. Joe Jacobs. He has two. I've always wondered why the 78th and 102nd New York share a monument. Also, how did they get all the names for the Pennsylvania Memorial? Have they ever had to take the na- a name off of it or add one? Just curious. You're not just curious, Joe. You want to know because you sent in a question. Well, if you're just curious, then we'll skip it. Yeah, we'll just skip it. <laughs> the, the 78th and 102nd uh, were combined after Gettysburg. So they become one in 1864 because of the attrition in both regiments so they share a special bond that way i don't didn't they also i don't know if they were next to each other regiments but but yeah they're in the same brigade they're in green's brigade and get swept off to tennessee after the battle of gettysburg um but the pennsylvania monument i talk about that a lot because i'll tell you why but um when you when you walk up to the monument and you see all the names, you see the stars next to the names of the dead, but also names that have been taken off the monument with an like a yeah, like, like, like an engraved like, like a mechanical chiseled off or something. <laughs> it looks like a like an etcher, or like something. a Dremel tool or something yeah. like that. Um, and so 1910, they have to try to figure out what record they're going to use to put the people that were here on the monument. So not the people that deserted right before the battle, if they can help, you know, the people that were at in this campaign present at Gettysburg. So the closest record they have is the end of every month, the Union Army gets paid. So it's the payroll record at the end of the month, which is mm-hmm. the day before the battle starts. Mm-hmm. So they figure, well, how, how much closer could you get is one yeah. day before at the end of June. Well, to put yourself in the perspective of a 19 year old boy from Pennsylvania who's been fighting and losing for two years in Virginia, mm. you know, it's demoralizing. And although things have been turning up in the army, they're feeding people better. Um, the hospitals are organized better. You know, there's there's still plenty of hope, of course. <laughs> but in certain situations, you just have people that are so tempted by the fact that here they come and their army is finally leading them out of Virginia and they're going back home. <laughs> so you'd be tempted to, if you were close by, to sneak home and see people maybe. Um, not knowing when the battle's going to be fought. Right. You know, maybe you had every intention to come back. <laughs> right, you were just saying um, hi. But you get some money <laughs> at the end of the month. So Oh, you're flush with cash. You're back home. You're not far from where you live, maybe. And who's George Meade? I haven't heard of him, you know. <laughs> and exactly. So Meade gets command of the army three days before the battle starts. And, you know, who who is this guy? Is he just going to lead you to another pretty embarrassing failure if it happens <laughs> right oh, here? The worst. And so there were soldiers that ducked the ranks right before the battle started, like that, that night. And as proof of this, so some people have just, you know, they're battlefield guides have their favorite regiment or regiments that their ancestors were in. And so in certain cases, you have really thorough research that's been done on like everybody from that regiment. And uh, my friend uh, Dave Donahue was researching the people in the 69th Pennsylvania, which Mm -hmm. fights right at the angle. One of the uh, monuments that we've adopted, by the way. Okay. That was your first one, right? We did them all at the same time. That was the first tour, but we adopted them all at the same time. Well, um, he said that there were several folks in that regiment that took the money, bought a train ticket, and went back to Philadelphia. Yes. Yes. Actually, that was uh, mentioned on our tour with Scott Hartwig. Oh. Yeah. And then he said one of the, the one, someone, uh, one of the guys who got away changed his name and enlisted later when they were offering bounties for in, for joining. So I don't know where he ended up. With oh, him. yeah. Yeah. There was a story like that, too. I, I'm... Yeah, who was that? I, I do remember that too. So, so, that's, so the story, that's why, ladies and gentlemen, you got to come to our tours so that you can remember it for me. So the story of the names that are missing is 
you know, they've got these people on the monument who got their pay, but weren't here. And who's going to know that? (laughs) Yeah. It's the people you left behind who fought the bloodiest battle, (laughs) you know, and you weren't there and they did this, they had to do this without you. Um, So then they, they what they said, but, but the Pennsylvania monument goes on the field in 1910 and 1913, you have the most people you're going to have Mm -hmm. probably, you know, from, from 50th uh, those regiments coming back save the time that they dedicated their monument and they're looking down those lists of names and they know you know mm-hmm. <laughs> who shouldn't be there so it causes the park service to revise the monument and i think the last revision happened in the 70s and they're just like this is this is enough because nobody's alive well <laughs> they they just got to make a commitment to what's on the monuments yeah. just like the confederate monument so yeah. so it's on the monument and we can put something up in front of it that says that interprets it but what's on the monument is on the, it's monument, on the monument we're just leaving it that yeah. way um so I don't know if you want to include this or not, but I can have another story. So one really interesting story I found on a Facebook group that I follow called uh, Retro York. And it's because mm-hmm. I'm from more of the York area, oh, okay. Pennsylvania. And my grandparents were active in their historical society out there. But this guy had a, an ancestor that was listed on the Pennsylvania Monument. When he was younger, his dad would show him the name of this ancestor. But he wasn't really enlisted with the regiment. It, it, his ancestors were farmers. And when the Confederate cavalry was out near Hanover, they were sweeping through and you know, taking everything. And then the Union cavalry fought them, you know, the Battle of Hanover. Yeah, yeah. And then everybody starts concentrating toward Gettysburg. So these farmers just joined up with the Union soldiers and rode off with them toward Gettysburg and they fought with a Pennsylvania regiment. And so huh. to honor them and their help and their service fighting with them, they put this man's name on their, I think it's the 26th um, Pennsylvania. P-A? His last name is Maul. It's not the the, the emergency? No. Okay. Uh, like it's on the right side of the memorial. Okay. The and right so, side and of, so then from where? The front. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the well, the south side. So yeah, so when you're looking at the stairs, turn right when you go around the monument. Go ahead. And uh, so I guess, you know, his dad took him there when they were little, showed him the name on the monument, and then he goes back, you know, after this. And so the the, the last revision in the 70s, and there's just a ground off empty space because oh, he wasn't no. on the roster. Oh. And they didn't. They, so it was something that the regiment did. So that was like did. a sad mistake. The regiment, the guys in the regiment did but that. Just from his story. So he's, you know. That's that's his. No, but story. I'm saying they they added the name apparently, yeah, to honor this guy that you know was brave enough to fight with the. So John Burns then isn't the only um, civilian that came and fought with uh, the army. Is that uh, that's? Uh, I mean, do we believe this story about the guy from the 26th? I don't know. I <laughs> I say yes. <laughs> I like that. I'd like to believe that story. Never let the truth get in the way of a good story. No, exactly. Here is uh, another example of not letting the truth get in the way of a good story. A direct descendant descendant of the general himself, uh, one of our newest patrons, Roy Mead. Are you serious? I don't know. But don't let <laughs> but that get in the way of right a good right story. Right, right, right. He says, hi, Matt. My question for Jesse is, why did North Carolina purchase the land where the North Carolina Monument is? Was that commonplace? And does North Carolina still own that land today? Thanks for the great shows. You are awesome. And Eric's kind of okay, all right, as well, too. Well, thank you. Fair thank enough. you, Roy Mead. I'll take that as a win. <laughs> Now, we might have... Did, did, did he answer you back, Jess? During the break, Jesse told uh, us that... Okay, I've, I, had a, I phoned a friend for this because yes. I wanted to know the, the details. And the story I always heard but never looked at the deeds or anything like that was that North Carolina purchased the plot for the monument before, like as part of their fundraising. So they got $50,000 and the story was that they had to buy the land itself, that little square that they're on. And that's what those big pillars on each corner of the plot were for. 
But I have a friend who's an expert at this because he loves the story of every single piece of land that's been added to the park. He's got, he had extensive access to the Park Service Library and has collected and organized all of this stuff. So he could tell you the farmer's name who owned whatever spot you're standing on (laughs) (laughs) and the year that it was incorporated into the park, whether it be by the GBMA, by the War Department, or you know, five years ago. So his name is Ben Dixon. He is a doctor and a professor at uh, SUNY University. Mm. And he tells me that North Carolina never had to buy anything. They didn't have to buy the land because it was already part of the park. So this is this is a pretty big. <laughs> so this is a huge, yeah, uh, yes, story. But here. he's like, he just sent me. He sends me like three emails on this. I did just text him to see if he wanted to be on the podcast, but he said, he says I am swamped tonight. You go ahead and say it for me. <laughs> I'm not going to take the credit. Um, All right, so but, we're not calling him tonight. All right, so so but now. But Where does so the story come from? Because there's, there's a big plot of land that the park acquired in 1907, uh-huh. and according to the records that he has, all of the Confederate like it was a huge Pickett's Charge land purchase, like all that area, and that this it was in where the North Carolina Monument stands today was on land that was already part of that acquisition so why would they have to buy something if the war department already owned it so the war department didn't buy it from north carolina no because when his last date is 1907 that it is in the hands of the war department okay that's when it is and so and then i was like the other thing i asked him was 1907 is when it was placed in the hands of the war department when they acquired it okay so who had it beforehand? Wait, when was the monument? I know that he knows, and I can get that for you. Okay, <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> well, wait, do, do we know when the monument was built? It was nineteen twenty nine. But they, they started organizing okay. it in twenty seven. So f- all right, fine. So then, then if the War Department had that property in nineteen oh seven, and the monument was put up in nineteen twenty nine, in order to be def- definitive on, in order for me to you know put my name on this, I w- I want to know where the story comes from. So there's a story of the story. Where where did that start, and what caused it to start? Was it just some sort of wording? Because it, you can find newspaper articles very thoroughly describing what's going to go there. So where the that the stones are going to be on the corner of the plot, but does that just a, do people think that that just means that they own it? Right, because cause, it's, cause it's there the are area those, they're planning to put the monument, but it's not really. Those, there are those ever. corner markers there, which are part of the monument, but they're on the corner of North Carolina soil, which is what I was always told. Right, did the veterans just say that, you know, at their reunions? You yeah, know, maybe. this is my land, you know, or right, something. Right, right. I don't know. But so, so I, just, I, I asked somebody this. About this, this story. Okay. And it was somebody who, I can't remember exactly who it was, and I don't want to say their name because if it's wrong, I don't want them to get uh, yelled at by people online. But uh, it was someone affiliated with the Park Service. I can't remember if it was current or retired. I talked to a lot of people. Anyway. I just don't think anyone that has worked for the Park Service is obsessed with this subject in the way that Ben is. <laughs> so that's why <laughs> well, I just have a hard be. time refuting this because I just know I, I haven't known him for very long, but well, I know wait. that he's passionate about this and cataloging this and organizing this. I almost forgot now. I think I forgot what the story was. It, it, was, it wasn't that they owned it. Mm-hmm. But for a period of time, they maintained it. Oh, okay. They took the the okay. the exp- they they paid for the maintenance of it. Mm-hmm. Maybe during the depression, but that doesn't make sense. That the, that a state would be paying like an adopt a position. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Um. So, right when I had asked them, I heard that North Carolina owned this soil until 1930 or 1933 or whatever it was. And well, they that's go, what everyone says. So I've been saying, and, well, yeah. and so I'm going to stop saying it yesterday. Well, so, <laughs> so, but this person said, no, they maintained it, but it was always park service. Um, what I'd like to know is where that story started. Yes. And, uh, and how sure, how is your friend so sure? 
well, how is he so sure? And everybody else, everybody else, if there's 10 people telling this story, right? Mm -hmm. Or if no, if there's 10 people talking about North Carolina, the monument. History is an ever evolving. Nine of them are saying the story that we are aware of that we've always heard. One of them is your friend and he's (laughs) saying that's not true. So how does he know so confidently? Because he studies deeds. Mm. Yeah, I was. I was. He's just a deeder. Say, <laughs> you know, nine out yeah. of ten people are telling telling the, a yarn that the 151st PA was the school teacher regiment because <laughs> there was a whole company of school teachers yeah. and there's like ten. Right. Yeah. Uh, that I mean, that the battle was fought over average. shoes because there was a shoe factory yeah. here in Gettysburg. <laughs> Weinbrenner Shoe Factory. <laughs> it, there was a Tom McCann at best. Maybe a Buster Brown on the other side of town. But that was it. I always thought it was an Oshkosh Bagosh. <laughs> you just wanted to say Oshkosh Bagosh. Absolutely. <laughs> so Boy, the, howdy. The, the other thing Ben has been doing is all the, the guides know him because he has this ongoing research project. Just researching how... Um, everything from the guide's perspective has changed over the years. So it's really interesting. Uh, oh, that is interesting. Like what? Like from. what do you mean? Like he wants to know how you give a tour. So everybody has something that they feel most comfortable with and a way that they give a tour that's not it's not only your personal preference, it's how it's what's going on in the world at the time. All all sorts of things influence this like like the influence of the Gettysburg movie. You know, a lot of us are realizing sure. that people haven't seen that, you know, it's getting outdated and and because people have had to fight back and try to represent people other than Chamberlain. Mm. Now there are new favorites. So Mm. there's always going to be, you know, so Culp's Hill is, is bigger now than it's been in a long time. It's going to be bigger once they close little round top. (laughs) Right. I'm looking forward to that. Culp's Hill. It was all the right flank. (laughs) though. It's the only (laughs) flank there was. No, but you're right. Things change over time. And no, that's a great point because the movie, uh, Tim always says that uh, when he was a youngster growing up and coming here, the first Minnesota was the 20th Maine. Not that they were on Little Round Top, but they, that was the regiment that everybody was enamored with, was the first Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Now you don't even, nobody knows about the first Minnesota unless you know, like you're really into this stuff. Well, Tim knows about it. Tim knows about it, and I'm sure he tells people on his tour. I know Bob does. I've I've been on tours. No, I with mean Bob. Uh, my guy today from Minnesota. <laughs> what? Oh, oh you're tell oh, that Tim. <laughs> well, I would hope you would show someone from Minnesota the first Minnesota. Um. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on to the next one. There. Uh. Tim Dolan, Timothy Dolan, Cardinal Dolan. He says, what's the story of Wisconsin's dedication day? I see they were all dedicated on the same day, and I've heard of newspaper articles describing speakers at the event, but detailed records and transcripts of the day are non-existent. The Cardinal would like to know. I found all of them. No, I'm just kidding. No, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Poor Uh, I looked, so I I would love to have, have found Something, but it seemed to me what I did was I had like a week uh, to get ready for this episode. I wasn't expecting so many specific questions, which was cool. I learned a lot and definitely found some stuff. You're welcome. I'm going to add to some tours in the rabbit holes I discovered in in the midst of this. But I, I just pulled out all of the Wisconsin regimental histories and the secondary histories that it compiled the there are a bunch of Iron Brigade books and just to see if anyone referenced anything like that. Cause I know that, you know, if stories are being told at those reunions, that's why people like to, to use them. It's just another, another source, but I couldn't find anything. And what I found was it seems to me that the Iron Brigade and also the Wisconsin regiments uh, took, were more excited about their reunions in Milwaukee. <laughs> mm. So the reunions at home were, a, 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 I wouldn't say, a, I guess, yeah, they were a bigger deal. <laughs> it's easier to get to. And some stuff happened um, like, <laughs> okay, so the 26th Wisconsin, who fought on the first day near Barlow's Knoll, they had a major reunion in 1887 for their 25th anniversary of the regiment. So not... Um, not of the battle. Yeah. Right. And so 1888 is going to be the big year for battle monumentation. But 
Uh, they had this big 25th anniversary there, but they're a mostly German regiment. So their speeches are in German. <laughs> oh, and, yeah. And that's the only picture I could find of one of the Miss Wisconsin um, uh, dedications at Gettysburg was what the Milwaukee Historical Society has. They have a picture of it with the veterans there and they have all of the people in the picture labeled. But then the Iron Brigade has a huge... So that's one year before Gettysburg. So they just did this big reunion. And then the Iron Brigade has a huge reunion in Milwaukee in 1880 with 150,000 people wow. in attendance. Uh, Ulysses S. Well, President Grant is there. Sheridan is there. They have their mascot, the Eagle, Old Abe. And then Old Abe dies oh. right after the series. So maybe they, they don't have their eagle. They already did. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, they were, they were here. But it seems that um, they note the 50th anniversary in the in the histories, but not really the dedication. Of. Yeah. Just, uh, okay. Well, I, I would imagine uh, it's probably, you know. It's it's a long distance to travel back in those days, you know. Well, even and by railroad. Like Pennsylvania at Gettysburg was written by John Page Nicholson, who's a park commissioner, as mm. well as you know invested in the Pennsylvania story. So he's got even he was like a, a hoarder of <laughs> of correspondence and stuff like that. So he was really passionate about saving every little snippet, every little tidbit. I found a similar situation with with Michigan here. Okay. Mm. Um, Michigan was actually good enough to compile a book of their dedication speeches and whatnot. Uh, it's called Michigan at Gettysburg, of all things. Makes sense. And uh, like half of them, half of the monuments were were dedicated without any of the survivors of the regiment being here. Oh, wow. Huh. They just they, it, It's a long distance to travel. These are getting to be older men. Yeah. And they just didn't Well, come. and didn't they want to say there were like more financial there's more financial assistance at those bigger reunions for people to get here i th yeah, yeah that sounds familiar yes yeah uh, I, I think pennsylvania actually contributed quite a bit uh i know pennsylvania paid for the uh rail railroad fare for any of their uh veterans to come here i think new york did the same thing i i don't know that any of the midwest states did they didn't have the money. That fare was too uh, too expensive. So yeah. Anyways, just gonna let that hang for as long as possible. Yeah. All right. So uh, Martin Husk, uh, the great author of the book about the 111th uh, New York. Um, he, of course, you can listen to his uh, interview over on Patreon. Uh, Martin, he's got a he's got several questions here, but in the interest of time, we're gonna we're gonna cut to uh, number two there, Jess. It's most people are familiar with the monument controversy between the 12th New Jersey and the 111th New York, where veterans of the 12th contested in writing where the veterans of the 111th wanted to place their monument. Are there other examples of other, where other regiments battled over the placement of a monument? Oh, are there, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, he says most people are familiar. Uh, oh, Ginny Wade, our, uh, or Ginny Weed, excuse me, our, our mascot here this evening is getting into lots of trouble eating uh, the rat poison I put over there. <laughs> Wouldn't uh, be the first time. <laughs> <laughs> might want to put the, some charcoal down her throat pretty quick. Uh, okay, so Jess, um, uh, Martin says that most people are familiar with the monument controversy between the 12th of New Jersey and 111th. I'm going to say most people are not. So would you give a little background on that? You don't know it. Okay, well, um, I'm going to guess. I'm just taking a, a guess here. I don't actually know myself, so I was kind of hoping... <laughs> but uh, I'm going to guess just based on where they were, there's kind of a little bit of an overlap there. And I'm guessing the 12th New Jersey was probably saying something like, hey, you guys were kind of behind us. And then the 11th, 111th New York was like, well, no, we were over to the side of you. And then, you know, and then then frankly, for the next 100 years or so, uh, New York was dumping its sewage uh, at the Jersey Shore. Actually, the 12th New Jersey says the 111th New York was never there. No, they don't. Swear to God. Yep. Well, we all know that's not true. They were there. I read Martin's book. I know, but really that's what. That? Yeah. That's that's. And we see sickening. their ghosts all the time. That is, I know we see, and we know that because we have seen their ghosts. I'll, I'll bring I'll bring the book in. 
tomorrow. <sighs> what book? I have New Jersey at Gettysburg, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, bring it in. I should probably have that one. I just was, I'm should. just so happy to get out of New Jersey that I don't want to, you know. I close my eyes when I drive past the New Jersey Monument. Probably shouldn't be saying that, but whatever. Well, I live with one friend? of your kinsmen. So. I know. Well, she got out, too. She did. Uh, all right. So anyway, let's let's get on to that then uh, there. What, what other examples are there of regiments battling over the placement of monuments? I mean, the the one that I'm most familiar with is the 72nd Pennsylvania at the angle because there it made it all the way to the Supreme Court yeah. <laughs> with the it was the I believe the 72nd against the GBMA um, and the it part of it had to do with a lot of information the GBMA was getting from people that I guess had some sort of beef with people in the 72nd in their own brigade. So the 69th Pennsylvania, there's a guy who just created so much, uh, you know, argument to the contrary that they weren't on the front line at the wall when the action was happening, um, that they doubted the spot. And um, things got interesting when they're, they're still like battling this in court and a member of the 72nd thinking that they had permission was just going to start digging, <laughs> breaking ground for the monument and was arrested. <laughs> now, the 72nd uh, for people, that's the monument with the guy who's got the club musket. Uh, up over his shoulder. Is that right? Right. So one of the most controversial monument placements is uh, the most photographed is on the Gettysburg quarter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Right. <laughs> Which I don't know. is probably fitting. <laughs> <laughs> but so it's up there right on the angle. And the, the argument is that they never were up on the wall like that. They were, they came in, but they didn't get that far, right? And right? If, the, if the, so the 69th and 71st were at the wall first and the, the rule that they had, the, the park had was that if someone is on the front line and then someone comes up to that line later, their monument should be 20 feet back from the people that were there first. So that's what you see on Culp's Hill with the right. double lines right. of monuments to just sort of sort out the chaos that was the battle especially in that area so you know what is he doing on that monument he's clubbed his musket he's about to break somebody's skull with it you know do you think that these people are just looking around in this mess of union bodies like well there's the right flank of this regiment and here's the left flank of yours you know right, so right. so that i think is is part of it but but they actually, the, their biggest problem, the 72nd, was that where the GBMA thought their monument should be was considerably further back than they would have ever been. Um, so, like, even behind Hancock Avenue. Oh. So, it's like, really, neither was the best <laughs> right. choice. Right. What about but, somewhere in between? They couldn't land on that? Well, like, back where the, is it the 106th? Yeah, the I drums. Think, I think they were. Oh, yeah, I think they were supposed to be on the opposite side of the road, like on the closer side, like the, yeah, the in, other side of the, the road, closer to the wall, position. with an maybe an advanced marker. So that, like, that's what the Massachusetts regiments did. They have their yeah. main monument where they were most of the time, and then they rushed the cops of trees, and they have these tablets up there. I mean, there's a whole story. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> with well, that I, from what I remember, their their main monuments were originally up close to where those tablets are now. Uh, but they were when the GBMA came out with the line of battle policy, they had to move them. Mm. And so they complied. And then the 72nd Pennsylvania shows up and they want to put theirs right up on the wall. And uh, Massachusetts, I think it's the 19th or 20th mass. Uh, they they get into the fight, too, along with the 69th PA uh, kind of saying this is this is B.S., you guys made us move our monuments, and these guys are just allowed to do whatever they want. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, so, I mean, they obviously came in on the the side of the 72nd Pennsylvania, and I honestly don't really think that, other than <laughs> certain members of the other regiments, that people had that much of a problem with it. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm looking. It's not the 106th, but I'm looking up the monument that you're talking about. And uh, so keep going with your uh, you want me to give you the next question there? Well, when um, right before the 150th anniversary, there was a oh, it's 106 Pennsylvania. I was looking up 106 yeah. New York, but it's 106 Pennsylvania. You're right. 
they're ahead. part of the Philadelphia Brigade. Uh-huh. The same mm-hmm. makes sense. Um, but um, right before the 150th anniversary, we had that thunderstorm slash tornado, whatever it was. Oh, and it blew it over. Right. Yeah. And I was on the first <laughs> tour that morning. I was on a. I wasn't a guide. I was on a Segway tour, and. I was, we were just like, whoa, like what happened here? Cause there were branches down everywhere. And it's amazing. We made it through the park to that point, but it, it was on posts. Like there's this, these bars sticking up out of the monument. And it's yeah. just like, well, why would something that heavy need any more <laughs> security than to be slipped on top <laughs> of these why. posts? But I guess it sucked it up and like tipped it over. Yeah. Well, it must have been a tornado or something that went through there. What do they call it? A microburst? Right. There's, just, microburst there's just not enough, or... you know, there's not enough, there aren't enough trees in that area to really prove that the wind turned a certain way. Mm. But I always used to joke that, you know, it's right before the 150th anniversary. You know, the Confederates were sick of that guy <laughs> waving his musket at them all those years. Is it the Confederates or the 71st? Exactly. Mm. Oh, is that 16. where you were going? Right. Sorry. So it's like, I thought it was the Confederate ghost this whole time, but maybe it was, <laughs> it was the ghost of the guys right next to him. They're like, yeah. get back, get back <laughs> like, there. F you. Um, all right. William Richard, I'm sorry, Richard Fish first from San Antone wants to know why were so many more monuments erected at Gettysburg than at other Civil War battle sites? I mean, you know. Well, it, it's because it happened so soon. Oh, um, exactly. All right, Marky Mark, relax. <laughs> So the GBMA is established in 1864, but by comparison, because I was just curious about the dates of the other battlefields that are comparable. You know, Chickamauga has about as many markers as Gettysburg. It's just most of them, they have a lot of um, tablets that tell the story. Government markers. Yeah, but they also have quite a few, I'm not sure the number, but they have quite a few regiment, like really nice ones. So the thing here is we've got... Uh, things put up by the veterans. We've got things put up by the the government. So Chickamauga didn't really get on board or didn't get um, established as a as a park until 1889. So we're we're you know 20. Could years it be ahead also that uh, Gettysburg was accessible right away to people? It wasn't in a war zone anymore. Like once everybody well, left. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's more not like than Virginia. that. Right? There's the money. <laughs> So we're in the north. It's a north. It's it's a battlefield that the you know states with the money have the most investment. Not the most investments in, but right. It's yeah. it's, it's accessible. It's not like you know because uh, everybody was coming down as as soon as they could. As soon as they heard the battle was over, people were getting down here for various but then, reasons. And Antietam is also you know considered a northern battlefield, but all they had was the National Cemetery for years. And so yeah, they but, had the cemetery in 1867, which was after our cemetery, and then really not any as far as land acquisition, nothing else until the 1890s. So that's when we're already past the monumentation yeah. era. Yeah, <laughs> but Antietam the though, of it. Antietam is a pain in the butt to get to today. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's not right. like Gettysburg, you, you have 10 road. roads coming in, you <laughs> right. got the railroad. So, so they would bring these monuments in, but, well, they had the CNO Canal, uh, so that huge soldier monument at Antietam. Yeah. They, they like dropped it on the way yeah. and they had to. <laughs> yeah. It's like the upper like third of the, it. like the upper third of the statue fell off of the barge but, into but the we, river and oh. it spent some time at the bottom of the river. Yeah. Oh, God. We, we biked the CNO Canal and it's just, you bike that towpath and you just imagine the giant head of this thing <laughs> just floating past you on its way to Antietam Battlefield. <laughs> yeah. But well, the railroad then, would bring it in and then you have these like Flintstones like vehicles that roll it out to the spot. But right. how they got them but, up on big round top. But that know. road though, <laughs> that road from the Potomac up to uh, Sharpsburg. I mean, in a car, I mean, it's so hilly and windy. Like, that must have been a nightmare getting up that road with that stuff. That's crazy. But, yeah, I, I would I would think that Gettysburg... All right, so do well, go ahead. Do you want more? <laughs> so then Gettysburg's accessible first. You got a monument here. And do you pay for another monument at Antietam? Do you pay for another monument at Chickamauga where you went after? The, some of them did. So yeah. there's yeah. a unit on Cemetery Hill. I think it's Pennsylvania that has a monument on Missionary Ridge. 
Kane's mm-hmm. Brigade. Mm-hmm. All, all three regiments from Kane's Brigade have monuments here on Culp's Hill and then again on Lookout Mountain. Yeah. Which is a super cool place. Yeah. yeah uh, right there. I guess there was, there's, there, you'd have to, you have to take it the, uh, the monuments story itself and every monument has a different story to it. And they're not all the same. It's not like a uniform reason why any one thing happened. Well, and a lot of it comes didn't. down to money. You know, everybody notices the 42nd New York because of the yeah. Native American that, can't fit in his house right <laughs> and but it's the most expensive regimental monument yeah and everyone notices it so the more money you have the more people pay attention to what you have on the field that was the most expensive huh regimental regimental interesting that makes sense that's a giant it's chunk a of bronze, bronze on top of yeah that. yeah and what and um then where did he fight the, the indian where did he fight was he uh at pickett's charge I don't know anything. I was down about south Chief of Devil's Den, wasn't it? Oh, he was down in Devil's Den. Oh, that's yeah. <laughs> the first battle of Gettysburg. Yes, he's from Tim's. Right, they uh, found his hatchet. Remember? Yeah. Right, right, right. Devil's Den. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, William Richardson. Oh, they might have found his skull. You remember that story? Over in the railroad cut. No, that skull they were going to auction in Maryland. It turned out it dated before the Civil War. It was like a Native American. Skull. Really? When was this? There was an auction in Maryland, and there was some note that said that the skull was dug from a farm, I think, near my house, like up north, like where, where the The high note is. said the the skull was dug at a farm near Jesse's house. Yes, specifically. It's so weird. <laughs> Why would they do that? Okay, I, I love how there's so much trust in these, you know, notes with artifacts. That <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Um, but you know, look, this it, is signed by Abraham Lincoln else? and it's a post it. But the, there was all this, you know, this pushback or, or controversy because they're auctioning a piece of a human being. <laughs> and oh, yeah. so they donated it to the park, but they can't just say, hey, this is a skull from a soldier. So they send it to the Smithsonian. And, and they tested it, it and found it was Native battle. American. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. So I guess it's still there. I don't know where it is now. Uh, I mean, it makes sense because, you know, they were here before we were. So I would imagine some of their bones are still in the ground. Uh, William Richardson, Bill Richardson, I like to call him. Uh, What was the first Confederate monument placed and was there much pushback against it? Uh, By the way, this Bill Richardson is the former governor of uh, New Mexico. Big fan of our show. That's not true. No, that's not true. (laughs) Well, maybe it is for all I know. I, I don't think it is, though. But go ahead. Well, I mean, that was the second, well, really the first Maryland battalion, which was Confederate. And we also refer to their monument placed in 1886 as the second Maryland battalion because they were forced to change the name of their regiment if they wanted to put a monument on, which is pretty huge. Yeah. <laughs> um, so already it's like the GBMA wants to, but they're sensitive to this because they know it's going to be you know controversial. And so um, one of the... It's, it's not the only thing they had to change. I think the first wording on the monument was saying, because it, it's going on the field, the only place that Confederates came into the fish hook and held ground. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so they are saying that they took the breastworks, mm, yeah. but they made them change it to say that they occupied mm-hmm. the breastworks because they're saying we weren't there. How could you take it if there was no one to take it from? And <laughs> uh, well, the 137th New York was there. Yeah, I mean, if you go into a house that's empty, no one's there, and you start living there, you've taken that. But house. there were people there when they fought that night, and yeah, just no one further down. Well, a lot of around. politics involved. You know, there. you know, right? Words. So they they did it. So the, they they made those changes. They got the monument on the field, which went undiscovered until the hordes of Union veterans reached the field. <laughs> they came back and they said, "This is no good." And I don't have any. I mean, th- there's got to be something there for. What do you mean? Something where? At the For, second Maryland? Before the the news articles came out. You know, I don't know if there's something in the local papers about about that. I don't know. I The the only place I've ever really picked up the story was right after Pennsylvania Day. I, I haven't really looked into 
local news stuff at all. That would be a question for Tim Smith. Are you saying uh, no local uh, paper stuff about uh, the second Maryland being placed? I'm saying there's there's probably more more there about what uh, what Uh, happened when it was, uh, you know, going on the field, but I I just don't have it. I got you. People really start losing their minds about it. And Wisconsin might have (laughs) speeches in some, you know, historical society somewhere that just hasn't been looked into. Yeah. Uh, Brian Derenick, he says the 83rd Pennsylvania Monument includes an officer with a striking resemblance to Colonel Strong Vincent. Although Pennsylvania Battlefield Commission rules forbid the placement of an image of a regiment's uh, commanding officer on a monument, were there similar requirements by other states and or originally by the War Department when the park was created? Okay, now we went through this before. Yeah, so Eric, you can answer this because I'm tired. Oh. <laughs> but this isn't Ask Eric, it's Ask Jesse. I trust Eric. All right, go ahead, Eric. Uh, just right. in the form of a question, because we're not the experts, Eric. Uh, it's like we gotta, Jeopardy. Yes. No, Say it in the form of a question. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. <laughs> this doesn't make sense to me. So, Are you sure you from don't what know how to do I know, <laughs> there you go. There it is. There from what I Couch remember. with doubt. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, because I'm not an expert. Right. There's the <laughs> we disclaimer. We're not experts. Um, so Strong Vincent on top of the 83rd's monument is not, in fact, Strong Vincent. Uh, according to the 83rd, it is a, it is an officer who looks very much like Strong Vincent. Uh, and it's because the GBMA had a policy in place uh, that said you can't have a monument to... Uh, a specific officer below like a division commander, right? So you think, right, it's, Eric? It's, you think. It's the 63rd Pennsylvania runs into this problem. They want to put Alexander Hayes on top of their monument. Mm. And they assume, <laughs> yeah, incorrectly, that when they show up here to dedicate their monument, there's going to be a statue of Alexander Hayes on top of it. Mm. The problem is they said that <laughs> they said in their monument proposal uh, about the design, this is Alexander Hayes. So mm. it got nixed by the GBMA. Nobody told the 63rd. They showed up to dedicate their monument and refused to do so because it wasn't the monument that they wanted. Uh. And so the 63rd PA leaves here without actually dedicating their mind. I don't know that they ever actually did come back to dedicate it or not. Well, that's the thing, Eric. We don't know, right? Because we're not experts. No, I'm not an expert. We're guessing. I'm really not an expert, though. So just like, I no, know, it, I, it sounds I, like I'm being facetious, but I'm really not. No, I'm not being feces either. I'm, yeah. uh, <laughs> we are not experts. Jesse's an expert, but she has abdicated her role. So <laughs> I'm not an expert. We, yes. But now, I strive to be closer to one. Right. Now, hold on, though, Eric, though. The other thing, though, is that the, the premise of the question is wrong. We think, right, because we're not experts. But uh, the, it, it was in Pennsylvania that said you can't do that, right? Yeah, no, it was the GBMA. It was GBMA. So let's... let's, let's uh, and then the War Department kind of just continued, continued. the GBMA's like, monument placement policies. Right. Like they kept with the line of battle from what I understand. Yeah. So a lot of the rules are about, you know, just organizing it in a way that uh, that can be studied, that makes that makes sense. Right. Um, So you don't want a a hodgepodge of Confederate monuments back where they started attacks uh, to kind of avoid the situation that happened with the second slash first Maryland. Now, what was that? There was a Confederate monument. It's like a, a, it looks like an old fashioned War Department brigade plaque, but it's actually to, uh, I think, an Alabama regiment, if I'm not mistaken, down on the The fourth Alabama. Fourth Alabama, yeah. Do you know the story behind that off the top of your head? Because that's not. The Southern Park Commissioner, I think it's William Robbins. Yeah. So he's got money and he places that there. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so the last one, Pete Erickson, he wants to know, he says, hi, did any of the stone for the monuments come from the granite quarries in New Hampshire? So I learned some cool stuff. I really mm. like this subject. Yes. Because I love You have a friend who, who does <laughs> this, right? Like who splits rocks and all that? Don't you have a friend who does that stuff? No, but I, um, we're just Instagram friends. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh. There's a there's a place in Rockport, Massachusetts that yeah. they they do like barn, well not barn restoration, but but any sort of just traditional style granite right, like cutting. Old style. Okay. But yeah. I mean, the only difference really is they're you know at in the 1880s they're using steam to pummel out the, all those drill holes and then huh. uh, and then they put in these wedges and feathers they're like a like a prong and then uh a, like stake. a spike or yeah. a stake goes in the prong and then you just along the the perforated row of drill holes you pound those stakes in and you can actually find them still sticking in rocks in the battlefield yeah i'd love if somebody from a granite company would come and want its work because i could show them all sorts oh of yeah now there's quarry. really there's all sorts of quarry spots on the field all over the place by the timbers farm uh, where else? There's uh, Devil's Den. Devil's uh, Den. Culp's Hill, right by Culp's the, Hill. the lower Culp's Hill. Uh, so oh, there's the quarry. The the difference in the selection of different pieces for the monuments is the quality of the granite based on the the bubble in the earth where it comes from. So in Westerly Rhode Island, there's this light colored, very dense granite that allows them to get all sorts of details into the stone. So like the the 17th PA Cavalry Monument by uh -huh. the Peace Light, you know, the, the reins of the horse are sticking out in stone from the, the rest of the monument. Mm. And you can only do that with granite that can, that can hold up to those types of details being cut into it so in new hampshire concord new hampshire had the best like sculptural granite, granite. and really the most successful company in new hampshire was the swenson granite company which is still in operation i found out uh as well as so westerly is no longer in operation but there's a really cool museum there <laughs> it's small but the people that work there have all kinds of it was totally worth it we had to divert our trip two hours <laughs> to go there on the way to maine last two years ago um but they they love gettysburg because <laughs> i think Who something doesn't? like 80 monuments have granite from westerly rhode island okay but of course, New Hampshire's the granite state. So I, I, so I didn't look up every single one, but I would assume that all of them are New Hampshire granite. The fifth New Hampshire is made up of boulders from the Gettysburg battlefield stacked. And then there's a, like a disc of New Hampshire Concord granite. And then one Gettysburg boulder on the top of it. It's probably the most unique monument on the battlefield. Yeah, I like, that's one of my favorites. And... The New Hampshire Sharpshooters is listed as Concord Granite, but there are also other monuments like the New York Auxiliary Monument, which mm -hmm. is 1920s. That's Concord Granite, and that's very you can see the more fine texture of of that one. I have to check that out now. And Closer. randomly, the base of the Barlow Monument, <laughs> Barlow Snow. So there's there's quite a lot of rock that was brought in <laughs> uh, from all over the place. Was but, a lot of it uh, locally done or locally uh, the, harvested? The Gettysburg granite is really uh, is really rough, so they're uh, mostly for like the stabilization of the bases of, oh, okay. of the monuments. It's so really not all not, it's good not for. sculptural, but right. yeah. and when they're putting in park avenues, you know they got to break apart rocks for that. Mm -hmm. So. People always ask the question, were these rocks here? <laughs> the diplomatic answer is there were actually more of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, there you go. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, that is all we've got there for the monumentation era. Oh, I got one oh, more Oh, you thing. got one more. Go ahead. So what I wanted to do when we were headed to Maine is I wanted to go to the Hallowell Granite company because they do like workshops where they do that in front of you like they, they show you how they cut the stone and how they did all oh, of that's that. cool so they're doing one this september and you can go on uh, YouTube and and see these things you showed me a video and it's very satisfying to watch when you hear the stone crack and if you want to know how any monuments are sculpted from the cutting the block from the quarry to the artists that that do uh, all the finish work and everything the Smith Granite Company has a has a book that they put together on just every last detail of it it's really applies to everything that was done in on the battlefields 
if you, um, I think it's on our YouTube, probably going back. I don't know if it was last year or the year before when I did, I think it was the year before cause I, I was wearing my glasses and I stopped wearing them last year. But anyway, so, uh, there, there's a video on our YouTube and I think our Instagram as well, um, about the 93rd Pennsylvania and, um, not them, but their monument, their second monument, which is out, uh, by the, uh, John, uh, what's his name? Likert. Thank you farm and uh it's an interesting monument to go and see it's on a boulder but uh the average joe doesn't even go near it first of all because you have to go down a driveway it looks like a private residence and it kind of is but it's also park so it's kind of confusing and it's just not inviting and you could go walking down there and you could see it and everything like that but you but i'm just gonna say this either go watch the video or next time you come here Make a little adventure for yourself and go find the 93rd Pennsylvania Monument and just look around at the boulders nearby. <laughs> just look at the boulders nearby, guys, and you'll see. And you'll, and you'll be like, oh, my God, this is so cool. This is so cool. <laughs> all right, we're slap happy. I've been here all day. And what, are you, what are they looking for? Is I'm not telling. It's the adventure, thing. Eric. You don't oh, hey, tell look, them Ron, the answer. Cool. Let's get in the car and go home no, now. Look at the rocks. Just look around. <laughs> so you'll see. I guess why I chose this subject is uh, the... Uh, it brings you to, to current <laughs> events, but it's also like a Hold weird a little second, scavenger Jesse. hunt. Easter egg hunts must be so boring for your kids, Eric. It's like, okay, I put one there, I put one there, I put one there. It's all about the finding. It's the we, search. Stop. Stop where you're at. We don't do Easter egg hunts oh in my, my family. Okay? You are a heathen. Thanks. Move on. You are a heathen. Okay, Jesse, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Ginny has something <laughs> to say. Ginny oh, wants to get in on it? Yeah, she says uh, it's long enough for one episode. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so go ahead. But the very first things that showed up on the battlefield are are crude rock carvings, and some of them not very crude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but the just the landscape itself just, I think, gave an emotional attachment to the people that were coming back to try to figure out how to recreate the story of what happened here. So, I mean, people like monuments because it gives you a little bit more of a an emotional attachment to the, the sculpture and the artwork and the people and who they were. Yeah. But just what, just what they were after from the beginning is just trying to remember the the people who were killed outright, you know, right in front of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but... And just to make sure that they're kind of desperate to make sure that that stays and that nobody forgets. That well, we, we certainly do have a lot of uh, monuments here, uh, monuments, markers, memorials, all these different words. They all mean different things. Or do they? Some use them interchangeably. Some don't. They mean certain things. I mean, it's just, there's so much you can get into on this. And we'll do more monument stuff uh, sometime in the future. But, uh, Jesse, thank you very much for coming by and, and doing this and answering all these questions that our uh, listeners threw in. Uh, thank you all for listening. And please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And turn those notifications on. And please consider becoming a patron today at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. Until next time, Eric, thank you. Jesse, thank you. Listeners, thank you. Ginny Weed, thank you down there. And until next time, like I already said that uh, phrase there, uh, have a good one. <laughs> I'm so tired. Our hearts so stout have got us fame, for sweet is known from whence we came. Wherever we go, they dread the name of Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's follow, drink down, and pay the reckoning on the mail. No man for that shall go to jail from Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's follow, drink down, and pay the reckoning on the mail. No man for that shall go to jail from Gary Owen and glory.